I need to give you guys an update. Our, our uh, last week we told you our five-year-old, one of our five-year-old grandsons was going to spend the night with us for the first time, and everything went. Oh, that oh, fine. Right. Yes, so it yeah. did go well. Didn't have to take him home in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> stuff, you know, so it went real well. And he slept? Yeah. He slept? Yeah. 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 Well. <laughs> so so he, he'll come again. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was so excited. Oh, so I have to bring him to see the train next time. Oh, he would like that. Yep. All right, well, welcome. Um, this is Ecclesiastes. We're going to be talking about Lesson 8 tonight, and we're going to be guarding against pride and wealth, particularly hoarding. And uh, we're still learning to fear God, and we're at uh, 5, 8, and 6, 12 as the passages for tonight. And uh, let, me, let me go ahead and pray and open this. Before I do that, I'll say it up front and at the end, there's no class next week. You guys have been such an outstanding class. You get a week off. So uh, you get to take a break here. You got to miss us when we That's right. That's right. Gracious Lord, we praise you. We thank you for your truth tonight. Your word that is true, eternally true. We thank you for how you've guarded your word and protected it. And we thank you for the great privilege that we can meet in public, in freedom, and in peace to read your word aloud. Help us to hear your word, Lord, tonight. And as you teach us your word, help us, Lord, not just to hear and go on, but to hear and grasp your word and to obey your word. Help us to hear your warnings tonight and help us to hear your admonition. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so a little recap. All right, so... Uh, again, the uh, chiasmic structure, the big point of the book is fear God. And that's where we've worked our way to tonight. And last couple weeks, we've talked about oppression, work, and politics. And last week, we talked about the warning against wrong worship. And tonight, we're going to talk about pride, and we're going to talk about hoarded wealth. These are specific warnings that, that trip us up as far as fearing God. Now, after we come back from the break, then the second half of the class, we're going to be working our way back through this structure, see how it, re it repeats itself. And so um, next um, uh, class uh, will be Ecclesiastes 7. And uh, as you read that, Think of it's a, it's a poem. It's another poem about time, but it's not like the uh, Ecclesiastes three. There's a time for this, a time for that. It's a different. It's a different style, and it's dealing with different issues. But it's a poem about time. I'm going to call it the two minute warning uh, that we'll be talking about. So anyway, by the first of May, we'll get back to this. Uh, but that's kind of an overview of where we're at uh, with things tonight. So this passage we're going to talk about tonight is the vanity of creatures trying to live without their creator, trying to be independent of their creator. And then we're also going to talk about the vanity of hoarded wealth. Now, um, I was going to ask you this. Um, you're going to say, well, we've talked about some of these things before, okay? But when you had your kids or even your grandkids or maybe some of you taught in public schools or something, did you ever have to repeat yourself? <laughs> no. Every time you said something, it just took and everybody got it and you never had to repeat oh, yourself, I right? So why do, you, why do you think the preacher is going to repeat himself a little bit tonight? It's, they didn't get it. It's important and we're slow to get it, right? Uh, both things happen here. So it's going to sound a little bit redundant, uh, some of this that we're going to cover tonight, but he's got some new twists tonight that we're going to have to consider. So this, um, have, have you been in, or do you think, pe you know, you've seen people where they have tried so hard to be self-sufficient and independent of God? Have you ever had to deal with that? We, you know, I, Right, or you hear it from our little ones, right? Well, I, I can do it. 
I don't, I, I myself, I don't, I don't need your help, right? And uh, it doesn't just stop when we're little. And if, um, but think about that. Have you had times where, you know, I, I'm, I can handle it by myself. I don't need any help from God or from anybody else. They ever got you in trouble? <laughs> Uh, but we're going to talk about this idea of being independent. Now, let me take you back uh, again. The Ecclesiastes has always got Genesis in the background. So how is Adam created? Do you remember that in Genesis 1 and 2? Yes. He's created in the likeness of God. Where does he live? Where's Adam and Eve live? They're in the Garden of Eden. Now, did they create the Garden? Did they make the Garden of Eden themselves? No. But God provides the place from the very beginning and also tells them to go and to fill the earth and to tend the garden, right? He gives them direction in life. They didn't set that course for themselves. They didn't have to find their way. God provided a place for them. There was a means of being fed and uh, later clothed, and they have a, a purpose and a course in life. They didn't do that on their, on their own. They, they, they were not independent. From the very beginning, the point here is that from the very beginning, man is a creature dependent on the creator. And the vanity that we're going to talk about tonight is when Man decides that he can live and try to be independent of, of his creator. Uh, remember the other word that we've used for vanity tonight? Starts with an A. Absurd. Absurd. So last week we talked about the absurdity of the creature not worshiping the creator. And tonight we're going to start off talking about the absurdity of the creature not being dependent on the Creator. So, so let's look at this tonight, and we're going to start in Ecclesiastes 5, 8. And I'll read down through 16 for this part. Okay. If you see oppression of the poor and denial of justice and righteousness in the province, do not be shocked at the sight. For one official watches over another official, and there are higher officials over them. After all, a king who cultivates the field is an advantage to the land. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. This, too, is vanity. When good things increase, those who consume them increase. So what is the advantage to their owners except to look on? The sleep of the working man is pleasant, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich man does not allow him to sleep. There is a grievous evil which I have seen under the sun, riches being hoarded by their owner to his hurt. When those riches were lost through a bad investment and he had fathered a son, then there was nothing to support him. As he had come naked from his mother's womb, so will he return as he came. He will take nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can carry in his hand. And this also is a grievous evil. Exactly as a man is born, thus will he die. So what is the advantage to him who toils for the wind? Okay, so as you read this, you say, well, what in the world is this uh, trying to tell me? The, the point here is that you, this person has latched on to money to make himself independent of God. That he that he can do, that he can protect himself, that he can sustain himself without uh, God's direction and, and guidance in his life. Um, so it starts out here uh, talking about how wealth. If you're after wealth, you're trying to accumulate wealth, right? This idea that I can accumulate wealth and I don't have to depend on God. You ever had that thought? I got enough money in the bank. I'm healthy. God, thank you very much. We'll see you later. You know, you know I'll run my own life. Thank you, because I've got enough resources. 
that I can be independent. So now he's going to give some warnings here about what this, this attachment to wealth and this independence, this desire to be independent by being wealthy. So uh, if you see oppression of the poor and denial of justice and righteousness in the province, do not be shocked at the sight, for one official watches over another official, and there are higher officials over them. What in the world is he talking about? Related to wealth. He's talking about the power of wealth to corrupt organizations. Now, it can be governments, it can be churches, too. If you read back in church history long enough. But uh, that wealth often leads to corruption and oppression. Um, wealth also is, you know, this idea that you have independence in your life because of wealth. Well, think about the money sloshing around in our political system and how that creates influence. Uh, wealth gives people influence versus other people who don't have wealth. That's the other part that he's, make, he's talking about. If you see oppression of the poor and denial of justice, do not be shocked at the sight for one official watches over another official and there are higher officials over them. In other words, the, the, they're all on the take, is what he's trying to say, that wealth has corrupted an organization. That that's one of the problems with, with people striving after wealth to be independent. Now, <clears throat> why would Solomon, if, you know, with Solomon's persona, okay, who the preacher is, he's writing this, note his um, attitude toward this. If you were the king, would you, how would you write about this? He didn't take any responsibility for it. Right? He, if this was really Solomon, would he not find himself at least somewhat accountable for the, the corruption in his government? Uh, this is one of the arguments about whether or not this is Solomon actually writing this or not. Um, another argument is this is Solomon and he's at the end of his life and he's looking back and saying, uh, Whatever, you know, that I, could, I couldn't fix it or I couldn't change it, uh, perhaps. But wealth as a means of independence from God, it has this corrosive effect in society is, is what he's getting at here. Um, now, this is an issue run over it or run onto it many ways in the, in the New Testament. Look at James 2. I was gonna, I'm going to keep your finger in James tonight. Remember, James is the, is the New Testament book of wisdom. And James is talking about the, corrupt, the corrosion that wealth is bringing in the churches in the New Testament. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Talk about wealth having influence. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes to a poor man in dirty, another guy comes in, a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who's wearing fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. So the, the power here, the warning here about wealth, uh, this desire to have money, and to be able to influence things because of, of having lots of money. That's what the warning's about here tonight. So it's um, uh, the, the corrosion uh, of this. Um, let me ask you this. What's the average U.S. senator's net worth? Millions. How many? <laughs> about 14. About yeah. 14. Wow. So that puts some... One, to be a one percenter in the U.S., you got to have about eleven million, eleven million dollars to be in the one percent. So the average in the U.S. Senate is fourteen. So, so the point, you know, it kind of illustrates the point here of of wealth being linked to influence and and possibly corruption. Um. Now the other thing about this <clears throat> is. Money will not satisfy. 
you know, that's part of the warning. This, this idea of being independent. The more money I have, the more independent I can be of God. Verse 10, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. This too is vanity. Think about what he just told us here. So you're standing back and you're watching this absurd world go around and around. And people are chasing after money with the idea that it's going to make them feel independent of God. It's going to satisfy them in some way. But it doesn't work that way. It's like crack. You get hooked on it. So you got to have more, and then you got to have more, and then you got to have more. That's the warning <laughs> Um, look back at James. James is going to tell you about the same thing. James 4, 1 to 2. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder, and you are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. So the, the warnings is you know, kind of like parallel over here in James. This idea that, well, if I just get so much money, then I'll be satisfied. I'll be content. And the preacher's saying it doesn't work that way in this absurd world. There's no, it doesn't bring contentment. It just feeds the fire. <clears throat> There's always going to be someone with more than you think. Right? Yep, yep. Always. Yep. And never, never end unless you're Jeff Bezos or somebody it. like that, yeah. right? Yeah, but I have, if I just had a little more, that this is this it's it's like crack, right? It's addictive, is what he's warning us about. Now the other thing about this is not only can you not get satisfaction with this the seeking after money. Look at verse eleven. When good things increase, those who consume them increase. Have you seen that? So what is the advantage to their owners except to look on? When uh, Liz and I lived in uh, near Indianapolis, one of our neighbors was an assistant coach with the Colts. And uh, he tells these stories about how these, these young players coming out of college, you know, they <laughs> signed these multi-million dollar contracts and everything. But most of them were broke by the time they left the NFL. And uh, because they had to have the big house and they had to have the cars. And usually they came with an entourage, right? Friends and family that wanted to get on the gravy train. And so the more they got, the more there was to consume what they had. So I'm not, I'm not saying all the NFL players are like that, but it was a big problem with a lot of them. But... Isn't this so true? When good things increase, those who consume them increase. We've all heard about the lot. The people win the lottery, and all of a sudden they find out they've got all these relatives they never knew that they had. Right. <laughs> so, so the more the more you have, the more there is to consume it. So it's not like you ever get to an equilibrium or satisfaction. Uh, or, this, or this sense of contentment uh, that you can be um, wealthy, uh, wealthy and, and not dependent on God. There's always something else that's going to rise up and consume it. Um, in a way, it's, it's funny, but in a way, it's scary, right? It's scary because the more you've got, the more the issues come with wealth. And so let's, let's see what he says about that. Verse 12. The sleep of the working man is pleasant, whether he eats little or much. But the full stomach of the rich man does not allow him to sleep. There's a grievous evil which I have seen under the sun, riches being hoarded by their owner to his hurt. So this craving after money, this crave, right? I want money so I can be independent. I can influence things. I can run my own life. I don't have to depend on God. It comes with a price. He says, the, the, the guy that didn't have anything, the working man, he can sleep. He goes to sleep. He sleeps all night. But he's not worried about who's going to steal from him. He's not worried about 
how much taxes he's got to pay or uh, a big mortgage on his house or a big property tax bill or the relatives he didn't know he had that need help. Um, so the full, but the full stomach of the rich man does not allow him to sleep. So you see the irony of this, the absurdity of this, the more I get, the more I get, the more I get, and the more trouble I get, I, it comes with it. it. It's not for free. This idea of having wealth to make myself independent, it's not for free. Um, the other um, thing here is that hoarded wealth is subject to loss, it's vulnerable. Um, there's a famous quote, some people have said this is from Jesse James, I'm not sure if that's true that this guy was a bank robber and the police have got him sat down and they're asking him, well, Louie, why did you rob the bank? And he said, well, that's where the money was. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, so think about this in terms of hoarded, hoarded wealth here, verses 13 to 17. There's a grievous evil which I've seen under the sun, riches being hoarded by their owner to his hurt. When those riches were lost through a bad investment and he had fathered a son, then there was nothing to support him. In other words, the vulnerability of, of wealth is what he's getting at here. And he, now think about Job here. He, he's, he's basically quoting out of Job. As he had come naked from his mother's womb, so will he return as he came. What happened to Job? What's, what was the story of Job, the first chapter of Job? Yeah, he's one of the, probably the wealthiest men on the earth. He's like this Solomon character, right? He's got an elephant. He's got camels and he's got goats and he's got lots of kids and they're partying and, and it's, it's, it's going pretty well. And in an instant, these guys come out of this direction and wipe his servants and his wealth out. And these guys come from this direction and wipe out another part of it. A tornado blows in and kills all of his kids. So he's gone from this to this in the blink of an eye. And that's what, that's what the preacher's talking about here. He's, he's quoting Job here. <clears throat> so he will return as he came with nothing. He will take nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can carry in his hand. And so you think of the old line, how many hearses have he seen in a funeral procession? Or, or how many U-Hauls have you seen in a, in a funeral procession, right? You can't take it with you. It's, so wealth is vulnerable, is the point. So stay, the idea here is spending all your time trying to make yourself protected by wealth so you're independent of God. It's a losing proposition. You can't get enough to be satisfied the more you get, the more people or things to spend it on. And when you die, you can't take it with you. So it's a losing proposition, is what he's telling us. Um, and also, this also is a grievous evil. Exactly as a man is born, thus will he die. So what is the advantage to him who toils for the wind? We've, and we saw him earlier back in chapter 2. He raised this issue of toiling for the wind. What did Jesus have to say about this? This issue of wealth. Let me, let me. Well, that's what he told the one guy, right? Uh, he told the rich young ruler that. Um, I was going to take you to um, first to Psalm 49, 17, which is pretty much... Uh, uh, reiterates this idea that we can't take it with us. Psalm 49, 17. And then I'm going to take you to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6. Um, so Psalm 49, 17 uh, pretty much says the same thing. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not descend after him. But the things that we accumulate in this world, uh, they don't pass on to, uh, to the spiritual world. 
what's physical stays in the physical world. Now, Jesus said this back in, uh, it's in Matthew 6, in the Sermon on the Mount. So, uh, it's a, di- you know, it's a different look at wealth here. Uh, it's the idea that you can help build the kingdom with it, uh, even though it is physical. Uh, Matthew 6, 19 to 21. I thought a rich man. Yeah, go ahead and read it if you got it. Well, I'm just remembering. Okay, Matthew 6, 19 to 21. If somebody's got it, go ahead and read it. I'm getting there. Well, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Yeah, go ahead. Do not, do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth, where, where moth and rust destroy where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. But where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. So the same warning that stacking up a pile of wealth to make yourself independent, that it makes it actually creates vulnerabilities. There's always somebody to take it. Uh, there's always Moth and rust, uh, uh, you know, there's always something you got to fix because the critters chewed it up or the rust ruined it or whatever it was. It can't stay. But invest in the kingdom is, is what Jesus' point here. So let me pause there. Uh, any, any other thoughts here on this warning he's given us about wealth as independence away from God? It's a losing proposition, is what the preacher's saying here. It won't work. Have you seen anybody try to do it? You seen anybody doing it today? Right? And this is a trap. This is a trap. To, to live right before God and not fall into this trap. That's what he's warning us about here in terms of fearing God. All right, so he's going to talk some more about wealth. <laughs> And, and how, many, how many TV shows are there about hoarding now? Hoarding. 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 It's incredible. It's incredible the number of these shows where they're cleaning out houses and you can't hardly walk through them. And these people are trying to help these people that are hoarding. I was reading this stuff about decluttering. It's almost like a, a cottage industry now that people come into your house and help you declutter your house because you got so much stuff you don't know what to do with it. And uh, I was reading one. I, was, I, was, I need a hot <laughs> The remark was that maybe we need to hire some of those people. But um, I was reading... Um, this, this one online where it was talking about how, uh, 33 ways to help you declutter. And one of them was to basically meditate beforehand and have, have soothing music on and, and all this stuff to try to help you let go of your stuff. To let go of your stuff. Can you, can, if, you, know, can you imagine, right? Um, stuff is stuff. Yes. Well, That's it, it's not for everybody. It's not for everybody. So he's going to warn us about hoarding tonight. He's going to warn us about this idea that you can fulfill your life by gathering stuff. Oh. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Stepping Step on toes. Huh? I can't hear that one. <laughs> All right. So let's let's read this. This this we're gonna I'm, I'm gonna step on toes. So uh, we're gonna go to Ecclesiastes six, verse one. Here. <clears throat> There's an evil which I've seen under the sun and is prevalent among men. A man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor so that his soul lacks nothing of all that he desires. But God has not empowered him to eat from them, for a foreigner eats them. This is vanity and a severe affliction. We've heard this before, right? He's, he, in the previous chapter, he talked about the same issue. If a, Okay, so now he's going to give you an example. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, however many they be, 
but his soul is not satisfied with good things, and he does not even have a proper burial, then I say, better the miscarriage than he. For it comes in futility and goes into obscurity, and its name is covered in obscurity. It never sees the sun, and it never knows anything. It is better off than he. Even if the other man, he's got another example for us, the other man lives a thousand years twice and does not enjoy good things. Do not all go to one place? All a man's labor is for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not satisfied. For what advantage does a wise man ever have over the fool? What advantage does the poor man have knowing how to walk before the living? What the eyes see is better than what the soul desires. This, too, is futility and striving after wind. Whatever exists has already been named, and it is known what man is, for he cannot dispute with him who is stronger than he. For there are many words which increase futility. What, then, is the advantage to a man? For who knows what is good for a man during his lifetime, during the few years of his futile life? He can spend them like a shadow. For who can tell a man what will be after him under the sun? Okay. Remember, the preacher, as he set out, he's not just hearing. I told you that time and time again, he says, I saw this. I saw that. He's out. He's trying to look in this world under the sun for these absurd, vain things. And so this one, he's raised this issue before. I've seen under the sun, and it's prevalent. It's not just a few people. It's a lot of people. A man whom God has given wealth and riches and honor, so his soul lacks nothing of all that he desires, but God has not empowered him to eat from them, for a foreigner eats them. This is vanity and a severe affliction. In the Proverbs, what's the picture of a man who fears God and walks with, rightly with God? What's, what, what comes to him? What's the reward for that? Do you remember in the Proverbs? It's three things. Life, honor, and wealth is what the Proverbs talk about. So he's referring directly to this proverb here. Um, a man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor so that his soul lacks nothing of all he desires. God's given this person everything he could want. But for somehow, he doesn't, he doesn't enjoy it. He's got so much that he can't enjoy it for some reason. He says that's a vanity and a severe affliction. Proverbs 22, 4. Uh, that's maybe the one I was thinking about. Uh, I put it in the notes there. Proverbs 22, 4. Uh, but that's, this is what I, I told you, that part of this book, he's challenging wisdom. In the sense that the proverb, that the proverb says this, is it always going to happen that way or not? And the preacher is saying, no, it doesn't always happen that way. Um, so uh, 22.4, the reward of humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. And the preacher is saying over here in uh Chapter 6 in Ecclesiastes, it ain't always so. Because I've seen this situation where God's given these things to a man and yet he can't enjoy them. He's got so much that for some reason he's not able to enjoy what God's given him. Um, Proverbs, I put it in the notes, Proverbs 13 22, it's the same idea here. So, this, this again, talked about how you have to tell your kids over and over again. And we've heard this before already from the preacher. To not enjoy and take pleasure in the things that God has given you in this life is vanity. He says it's foolishness. Verse uh, 6, um, so he, he uses the, this first example starting in, in chapter, in chapter, verse 3, he talks a man who's got 100 children and many years. Picture again in the Old Testament. Think about um, 
Abraham and his desire for a son and a legacy. The a, a picture of fulfillment in the Old Testament was somebody who had a long life and lots of descendants. Lots of descendants. And he says, well, here's a man. He fathered a hundred children. He lives many years, but his soul, his soul is not satisfied with good things. It does not even have a proper burial. And I say better a miscarriage than he. He's got stuff and he keeps getting stuff and he's not satisfied. And he's not satisfied. And preacher says it's better if he hadn't even been born. For he's talking about the miscarriage where it comes in futility and goes into obscurity and its name is covered in obscurity. It never sees the sun and it never knows anything. It's better off than he. It's better off that he hadn't even gone through the drill than to live life and accumulate and accumulate and accumulate and yet not be satisfied with it, he failed the test. It's better off that he hadn't been born, is what the preacher's saying here. It's, it's that absurd. All right, now he's going to use another example here in verse 6. Who's, who lived the longest that's recorded in Scripture? And how long did he live? 69. Just short of a thousand, right? Almost a thousand years. So look look what he references in verse six. Even if the other man lives a thousand years twice, if, if there's a man who lives twice as long as Methuselah, and he doesn't enjoy good things, do not all go to one place. Here's another guy that missed the boat. God gave him this long life and he accumulates and he accumulates and he accumulates, and he's not satisfied. Here's another guy that missed the boat. <laughs> so he's making references here uh, to these uh, other characters. Now Solomon uh, in 2 Chronicles 1.12 is kind of pictured like this, that he's got it all, that, uh, that uh, uh, God's given it all to me. And we talked earlier about, you know, what he did with it. Sick. Uh, this is where God told him, wisdom and knowledge has been granted to you, and I will give you riches and wealth and honor such as none of the kings who were before you has possessed, nor those who will come after you. So is Solomon talking about himself here? That's the, that's the point of that verse. Is Solomon talking about himself? And again, some people have said, well, Ecclesiastes is Solomon looking backwards. And maybe he's talking a little bit about himself here. I had it all. I had it all. God gave me all this wisdom, gave me all this wealth, and I was never satisfied with it. And that was absurdity. Have you met anybody like that? Looks back on their life and said, I wasted it. I blew it. I never enjoyed what God gave me. I had, but I never thought I had enough. And I had to get and get and get and I never was satisfied. And maybe they didn't say it out loud but quite like that, but maybe you've seen situations like that. Well, that's what Solomon's talking about, perhaps for himself here with these examples. Um, so this idea of an insatiable appetite for things and not being satisfied. Now, he's, part of this warning is... Um, it starts in verse 10 now. There's a war part of this warning about this is that hoarding, you, you know, as we think about this world under the sun, that's absurd. You're doing this hoarding in an uncertain world. And, and he talked about the example where the guy had all this wealth and then he lost it like Job. Um, and you're doing it with an uncertain future. You don't know how much time you've got. So, you know, some, and I'm guilty of this, I, I'm kind of living in the future, right? Planning for the future, you know, uh, very goal-oriented. There's someone nodding in the back row here. Um, but not living in the day and being thankful for the day and trying to always prepare and, and be 
so that you, you won't have a problem in the future. That's part of this. Verse 10, whatever exists has already been named and it is known what man is and, and it is known what man is for he cannot dispute with him who is stronger than he. Who's he talking about? This is a reference to Job. God. Well, he's, he's talking about God, but he's referencing Job's, you know, where Job was trying to argue with God about why did you do this? And God finally tells him, look, were you there when I did the creation? So he's referring to Job. We don't get to argue with God. God doesn't reveal necessarily what he's going to do. And we don't get to argue with him. That's just kind of how it is. So the idea that you, are, that, um, say you die prematurely, like these examples that he's just shown, that you get to this unfair that you can argue with God and say he was unfair to you. And so the preacher's saying, no, there's no dispute. For he cannot dispute with him who is stronger than he. We don't get to argue with our creator about how long we're on the earth or what our lot is or our situation. So hoarding and gathering all this stuff up and thinking that somehow God's going to be fair about you. In other words, he'll wait long enough until you're satisfied that you've got enough stuff, okay? And he said, no, it doesn't work like that. It's not fair in that sense. We don't get to argue with God. Verse 11, for there are many words which increase futility, but what then is the advantage to a man? We don't get to argue with God. We can argue all we want, uh, we can you, we can be mad at God, but in the end, He's the one that sets the times that we've talked about. We've seen that He's sovereign over the times. He's sovereign over the seasons of life. We don't get to argue. So God's the point I was making here in the notes: God's provinces are unknowable or not knowable, and trying to predict the future is impossible under the sun. And one cannot agree or argue or bargain with argue or bargain with God. And he's again, he's he's talking about Job here in the background. Verse 12, for who knows what is good for a man during his lifetime? During the few years of his futile life, he will spend them like a shadow. For who can tell a man what will be after him under the sun? We've hit this before. He's brought this subject up before. We don't, we can't understand God's provinces today and what he's doing today and how that's going to influence things for generations to come. Just like we don't know in our day what God was doing with our ancestors that's influenced us now. We don't get to know those things. For who can tell a man what will be after him under the sun? It's unknowable. So the idea of hoarded wealth, it looks pretty absurd. It looks pretty absurd. It's vain because we can't live in the future, make our pile bigger and bigger and bigger with the idea that we're going to be there. You pick your age. I'm going to, you know, I want to live to be 120. And if I keep hoarding, I'll be satisfied when I get to age 120. It doesn't work like that. Because tomorrow, my number might get called. Psalm 145.3. <clears throat> Psalm 145 is one of the worship psalms at the end of the psalms. Great is the Lord, and highly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. So that's kind of what the preacher's saying here. God's ways are unsearchable. We don't get to argue with him. Uh, it's, it's not much of an argument. It's like Job, where were you when I, when I did these things? So hoarding and trying to live in the future and get a bigger stack of stuff than everybody else, not knowing if I'm going to be able to enjoy it or not, because I don't get to set the terms of my life, it's all vanity. It's all vanity. But do we see people going down these tracks around us? 
So that's why the warning, this is a, these are traps. These are traps that have bad endings. He's, you know, he says, I've seen the guy that lived, you know, long life, had everything you could want, and didn't get to enjoy it. These are traps. So what's the right answer? What's the right thing to do? We've, we've covered this before, and he's going to say it again. What's the right thing to do in the fear of the Lord? The right approach to handling wealth. Take, to, to enjoy it and take pleasure in living today. So let's uh, go back up to uh, Ecclesiastes 5, 18 to 20, and he's going to say it again to us. I told you, that as you go through the book, there's about five or six themes that he just keeps beating the drum on. Right? World's absurd, world's vain, life is short, you're going to die. You can't predict the future. God sets the God sovereign over the times. And enjoy life today in the fear of the Lord. So here we are. There's the prescription tonight in uh, Ecclesiastes 5.18. So he's going to say it again. And again, why do we say things over and over again? They're important. They're important. <laughs> and we got... Um, um, when I was wrestling in high school, a wrestling coach told us that there had been a study done, and in order to do a move right without having to think about it, you had to do it 690 times. Oh. Mm. But you, you, the idea of repetition, the idea that you had to do it lots and lots and lots of times to be able to do it without thinking about it. And so you had repetition. That's my point here, repetition. So he's going to give us repetition, not quite 690 times. But <laughs> here we are. Uh, Ecclesiastes 5.18. Here is what I've seen to be good and fitting, to eat and to drink and enjoy oneself and all one's labor in which he toils under the sun during the few years of his life which God has given him, for this is his reward. Furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he has also empowered him to eat from them and to receive his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. For he will not often consider the, life, the, the years of his life because he keeps him occupied with gladness of his heart. So you walk out of here tonight, think about the gift that God has given you, the pleasures that we can enjoy right now. And the, and the mean, not only the, the pleasures that he's given us, but the gift of being able to enjoy them. Right? Think, think even about a meal, right? It's one thing to have a meal. It's another thing to be able to physically eat and to physically taste and enjoy the, the food. And, and what the preacher's telling us here, God's given us both things. He's given us what we need, and he's given us the ability to fit, to enjoy it. And that's one. You know, now later, when we get into this part of the book, he's going to talk about as we get toward the end of the curve and we start losing even the ability to, to taste and hear and walk and those kinds of things that go with, with old age. But the point is, walk out of here. Again, he's admonished us over and over again to enjoy what we've got to be content, enjoy oneself and all one's labor in which he toils under the sun during the few years of his life, which God has given him for this, it's his reward. Can't take it with us into the next life, but for this time and this situation in God's sovereignty, enjoy in faith what he has given us as a prescription. That's fearing the Lord. That's fearing God, the Lord, what we've talked about. Be content, enjoy what God's given you, take advantages of the opportunities he's given you. We're going to talk a lot more about opportunities when we get in here. But um, that's the point of the book. That's the point of the book. So you don't have to jump off the, the building. You know, we get so low, vanity of vanities. The point of the book is fear God. Watch out for these traps. 
which which take you out of the fear of the Lord and enjoy the life that God's given you with contentment. Any thoughts or questions about that? Yes, ma'am. Um, I was just reminded <clears throat> uh, when we were talking about pleasures um, of the uh, Chris Christopherson song, Why Me, Lord? You remember the lyrics? Why me, Lord, what have I ever done to deserve any one of the pleasures I've known? Tell me, Lord, what did I ever do that was worth loving you or the time that has come? Lord, help me, Jesus, I've wasted it. Yeah. So help me, Jesus, I know what I am. Now that I know that I've needed you, so help me, Jesus, my soul to know. Dependence, right? <laughs> Dependence, right? That's exactly that trap that he was warning us about. The idea that we can stack up all this stuff and somehow insulate ourselves from the world and, and from needing God. It's the wrong answer. So fearing God is living with contentment and dependence on our Creator. So thank you for that. So gratitude is kind of a railing to keep us from falling off the cliff into these yeah. kinds of things. Yeah, gratitude is a heavy dose of, of contentment, right? Mm -hmm. Saying grace at a meal is a dose of contentment. It's an act of worship. To be thankful for the food you've got, whether it's a hot dog or it's a filet mignon, right? It's being content with God put in front of you and the ability to enjoy it. So yeah, thank you. It's, it's a guardrail. Anything else tonight? Dana, I don't know where it's found in the Bible, but I know that one day St. Peter had gate duty and he was letting in people. And of course, he did not expect for them to bring anything, but there was this man with his suitcase. And Peter said, I'm sorry, we just don't bring anything in here because we don't need anything here. And the man said, Oh, yes, I need this. I've enjoyed it and I bring it up with me. And Peter looked at it and it was gold ball. Peter said, you have street material? Street. Uh, got what? Construction street material. material. Oh, street material. Construction material. Construction yeah. material. Yeah, Construction yeah. Material. yeah. 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 Revelation, yeah. we're told the streets yeah. are of gold. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Streets are gold. All right, so anything else before we close tonight? So, just a reminder, fearing God, now we're going to walk our way back work, and these themes are going to keep coming up again. Uh, and we're, we're working our way toward May the 1st, or first week of May, I think, is when we wrap up. No class next week. You've been such a stellar group. We get a week off. <laughs> so let's close tonight. Great Lord, we thank you again for your word, for your warnings. you would love us enough to warn us of these things. Help us, Lord, to live in contentment and dependence and trust in you, Lord. Proclaim your name. Help us to bear your name with honor and glorify the great name of Jesus. Help us to be content. Help us to take pleasure in what you have done, what you have given us, and the ability to enjoy it. We thank you for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.